and welcome back to Coco Sleep, a podcast of original children's bedtime stories and meditations designed to make bedtime a dream. Hmm, what's in a name? They're so much more meaningful than just words, aren't they? We tend to only name precious people and pets, or important toys and objects we hold dear. Tonight's story is all about butterflies and how they got their names. But first, I want to read out my special list of names that Coco has just given me to welcome our newest members of the Coco Club. Hello and welcome to Kian, Ellie, Piper, Cohen, Sophie, Nathan, Elliot, Matteo, Malia, Charlie K, Will, Addison and Jackson. We hope you all enjoyed the extra bonus episodes and hours of ad-free listening coming your way. What a lovely list of names. But back to tonight's story where we're going to join a little girl named Leilani who's waiting for her wonderful big brother to collect her from school to take her on her weekly trip to the butterfly garden. This particular evening, she overhears an interesting conversation between some of the butterflies discussing what they were called in their home countries and why. We're soon headed to a butterfly garden, but first lie back and relax with your eyes gently closed and breathing steady. See if you can imagine silent fluttering butterfly wings, fleeting flaps of colours and all shapes and sizes of flowers and plants. This is How the Butterfly Got Its Name, by Jane Thomas. Leilani found it almost impossible to go to sleep on Wednesday evening. Because Wednesday evening, you see, comes right before Thursday morning. And Thursdays are Leilani's favourite day by far. Everyone else she knew liked weekends the best, and they all couldn't wait for the week to tumble by so they could wrap themselves up in long Saturdays and Sundays, staying in bed that little bit longer in the morning and having all that time to do exactly what they wanted. But Leilani would like to bet that if they had the same Thursdays as her, then Thursdays would be their favourite day too. For as long as she could remember, And even longer than that, looking at the photographs on Granny's mantelpiece, Leilani had gone to the butterfly house every single Thursday. Every Thursday morning, Leilani was told who would pick her up from school that day and whisk her away to the butterfly house. Sometimes it was Granny. Sometimes it was Auntie Sue. Sometimes it was her neighbour, Robert. And sometimes it was her big brother, Calais. Leilani's big brother Calais was, she thought, absolutely wonderful. He would carry her high up on his shoulders so her fingers could brush against leaves nobody else could reach. He would let her stay up at night just a little bit later when she went to visit, curled up on the sofa with mugs of cocoa and warm hugs while he told her stories about all the flowers he knew. Leilani's big brother, Kalei, knew a lot about flowers because he worked for one of the biggest gardens in the country, helping create displays that won awards year after year. He always said there was nothing more relaxing than working with the earth. He showed Leilani how to grow flowers from the tiniest seeds, keeping them safe and warm on the windowsill and adding just enough water to the earth so it was damp but not dripping. And when the first tiny green shoots started to show themselves bright against the brown, she would turn the pots this way and that so they never grew sideways towards the warmth of the sun, but learned to grow tall and straight. Calais showed her how to gently lift the little plants and put them in bigger pots, and then to start putting them outside as the days became longer and the warmth from the sun grew. And he showed her 
how to bring them inside at night to keep them safe and warm against any cold or frost. And finally, he showed her how to choose the perfect spot in the flower bed for each and every plant she grew. The ones that would grow taller were planted along the back, and the little ones were planted along the front, and she tried to learn how to match the colours so they would look absolutely perfect. Calais loved the different greens of different leaves, and this was where his real skill lay. But Leilani was all about the flowers, always looking out for new, even prettier ones when she was out and about, and then dragging Calais to see them and tell her just what they were and how she could grow them too. Leilani also thought Calais was absolutely wonderful because whenever it was his turn to take her to the butterfly house on Thursday, he always made sure to take her to the cake shop first. Leilani was a little surprised to wake up this Thursday morning because she'd been so excited the night before she was sure she wouldn't get any sleep at all. But it turned out the bed had been so warm and cosy and the blankets so snuggly and the pillow so soft that she had fallen asleep after all. She had guessed it would be Calais' turn to take her to the butterfly house because she hadn't seen him for weeks and surely it was time. She was absolutely right and all through school Leilani thought about the cake and the butterflies and being lifted high onto Calais' shoulders. You would think that when the bell went and announced it was time for everyone to go home that Leilani would be the first out of the door. But Leilani liked to linger and savour this moment. She packed her school bag very, very slowly. Each pencil placed carefully into her butterfly-covered pencil case, and each book closed with slow precision before being lined up just so in her bag. While everyone else rushed towards the door, bags being dragged behind them and spilling out a tennis shoe here and a hairband there, Leilani made sure she straightened her skirt, pulled her socks up to just below her knees, checked the bow in her hair was absolutely level, and then, only then, did she pick up her backpack and put it evenly across both her shoulders. Then, she would push her chair under her desk, turn to smile at the teacher and wish her a lovely evening. Then, slowly, solemnly, doing her best to stop her beaming grin from breaking out across her face, she walked out to the playground where Calais would be waiting. Calais knew the game she played, and knew she liked to take time over everything, and he quietly joined in too. He would stand there with his hands in his pockets, smiling as she walked slowly across to him, then bending down to take her backpack from her shoulders. Hello, Leilani, he said, and Leilani beamed up at him. It was impossible to keep her grin trapped inside. Well, 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 said Calais slowly. It looks like it's my turn this week. I suppose you'll be wanting to go to the butterfly house? Leilani looked down at her shoes, taking up her part of the game they played. I suppose that might be nice, she said, swirling her shoe in the dirt. I mean, only if you've got nothing else to do. And I suppose you'll want feeding first, said Calais. You'll be wanting some cake. It was always at this point in the game that Leilani gave up and giggled out loud. And it was at this point that Calais let out his gorgeous, glorious laugh 
and scooped Leilani up with one hand and tucked her under his arm, walking her towards the gleaming red car parked just a few strides away. Leilani loved going in Calais' car. He always played music that no one else ever played, and he always made up funny dance moves, and journeys in the car took no time at all when she was with Calais. She sometimes wished she could spend a whole day in the car with her wonderful big brother, dancing to music and driving along the lanes with the wind in her hair and the smell of a thousand flowers floating in the air. The cake shop they always visited was a beautiful little tea room set beside a stream. In the summer... They sat outside on little blue chairs and tables, throwing crumbs of banana bread and pineapple upside-down cake and soft vanilla sponge, daring the sparrows to come closer and closer until they were almost eating right out of her hand. Today, Leilani chose a huge slice of delicious zingy lemon meringue pie. The meringue was so soft It floated on top of the sunshine yellow sauce like a little white cloud. The sun was warm and shone brightly over them, and if it hadn't been for the leaves on the trees waving gently in the breeze above them, it might have almost been too warm. Calais looked longingly at the weeping willows that poured themselves over the little stream. They must be over 50 years old, he'd once told Leilani. And he couldn't imagine waiting 50 years for the ones he had planted to get as glorious. But that was the thing about gardening, he explained. You needed patience. And you needed to be able to imagine just what something would be like in five and ten and fifty years' time and you needed to fill in the spaces with flowers that didn't mind being moved on as others grew bigger and spread their branches further and wider than ever before. Leilani loved the weeping willows too, but more because she always secretly hoped she would see Ratty appear in his little striped jacket, rowing his wooden boat across the waters towards a near-sighted mole on the riverbank, waiting with a picnic basket. It was a beautiful flash of orange fringed with black that made her hurry along eating the lemon meringue pie, a monarch butterfly, a reminder of the real reason she was sitting here next to Calais. And with every last morsel scraped from the plate, Calais, pretending not to notice as she surreptitiously dragged her finger across and licked the final moments of sweet lemon tang, they set off, hand in hand, to the butterfly house. Inside, it was always so wonderfully warm. A giant greenhouse with plants that reached to the highest points, where a little stream trickled around the edges. It had been there for nearly 200 years, and Leilani loved imagining all the people before who had walked in this same warmth and looked out for fluttering, billowing butterflies. Every time Leilani visited the butterfly house, she walked around with whoever was that Thursday's companion, and together they would look out for the butterflies and see who could count the most swallowtails and monarchs and skippers and heaths and coppers and painted ladies. But today, just as they were going in, Calais bumped into a friend of his he hadn't seen for years. Calais quite forgot Leilani for a moment, so she stood there, trying to look as patient as possible, but secretly, terribly, terribly impatient, waiting for him to take her hand and go round with her. Listen, lovely Lilani, Calais said to her, 
for that is what he called her when he was being especially sweet. Why don't you go and see if you can find a glass-winged butterfly, and I'm just going to have a chat for a few minutes. For a moment, Lilani was a little put out that Calais would rather talk to his friend. But then she thought how wonderful it would be if she really did find a glass-winged butterfly. So she smiled at him and said she'd see him later, and she trotted off to be folded away among the broad leaves of the elephant ear plants. Leilani took herself to the furthest corner of the butterfly house, the place where not many people bothered to visit, because you really didn't need to go so very far at all to be surrounded by and covered by beautiful, fluttering butterflies. And she thought she was really quite alone, until she heard voices coming from behind where the banana leaves draped, and the bright red stem ginger stood importantly in the corner, announcing the very edge of the butterfly house. She poked her head past the bananas, but couldn't see anybody. Butterflies gathered and rested on the long, gently waving leaves, and the voices grew louder and louder. It sounded exactly like the chattering in a theatre before the play started, a sort of mumble of shared ideas and excitement. And exactly as it suddenly stopped in a theatre when the lights dimmed and the curtain rose, so the chattering voices stopped when a huge green and yellow butterfly appeared and perched atop the bright red ginger. All the butterflies looked towards this new one, and Leilani swore she heard a gasp from one and a squeak of excitement from another. She couldn't believe it, because right before her, thousands of miles from its home deep in the jungles of Papua New Guinea, was a Queen Alexandra's bird wing butterfly, the largest rarest of them all. She was beyond beautiful, her delicate wings, emerald and turquoise and yellow, all at once in a glorious, shimmering stained glass window effect and lit up by the sunshine pouring through the grass. I call to order this first meeting of butterflies the emerald birdwing announced, and all the butterflies, by way of clapping, opened and closed their wings in rapid succession, such that for a moment a soft breeze was created that pushed Leilani's hair into dancing swirls. The birdwing looked as though she was about to continue when a little butterfly in the crowd rose from its place on the leaves and cleared its throat. (coughs) We have a problem, he said in a strong Scottish accent, for I am not a butterfly. The crowd gasped and turned to look at the creature, and Leilani was very confused for a moment, because, whether he wanted to believe it or not, he was very obviously a butterfly. He had bright flame-red wings and delicate orange fringed the edges. She wondered for a moment if he could be a moth. Oh, said the birdwing, a worried look crossing her face. Then, what are you, dear fellow? Do you suddenly think you're a bird or even a plane? The butterflies laughed nervously, but the one with the Scottish accent just sniffed the air a little. Where'd I come from? I am called a Jellinger, he said. I'm not butterfly, I'm Jellinger, and that means God's fire. Leilani gasped. What a wonderful name for a butterfly, she thought. 
She could imagine a whole host of butterflies gathered on a bush together, dancing around in the sunlight and looking exactly like a little fire. Made brave by the words of the Jelenje, another butterfly flew up from the leaf. And I am a summerfugel, he said, strong and clear. In your language, that's a summer bird. Even though Leilani could visit the butterflies at any time of year in the butterfly house, she knew that really they only flew in the outside world in the summertime, when the sun shone and the weather was warm, and the flowers opened themselves up. Leilani thought Summerbird was the perfect name for a butterfly, and she crossed her fingers and wished with everything she had that other butterflies would fly up and say their names too. She learned that in ancient Greece, a butterfly was called Psyche, which meant the soul. And she learned that many other countries had also named their butterflies after souls too which is perhaps because butterflies are so beautiful and calming, and when they rest on your finger for a moment, it does feel like a little piece of magic is with you. A Persian butterfly, all purple and gold and very regal looking, told the group that in his language he was known as a parvane, which meant the same as a guide or a leader. Leilani thought about all the times she had visited the butterfly house and followed one of them from flower to flower. And they really were such easy things to follow until you got quite lost among the high leaves. And then they'd lead you out into an opening and you'd know exactly where you were once again. A butterfly with a strong French accent announced that he was called a papillon, and that meant the same as ancient words for touch and feel. Leilani thought of the softness of the butterfly, how delicate and light they are, and she understood that word too. Another butterfly said it came all the way from a place called Cornwall in the far south of England, and it had been given a name that meant God's pretty thing. One that had come all the way from Eastern Africa said that its name in Swahili meant a fan. And as if to prove its point, it came and hovered just in front of Leilani's nose, fluttering its wings for all it was worth and creating a gentle breeze, just as a fan would do. The birdwing perched up on her red ginger smiled down at the other butterflies. When she opened her emerald wings, they were so wide they could have spread across both of Lilani's hands. She herself had been brought to the butterfly house from the far side of the world, and she was delighted that here, in front of her, were butterflies from every other corner of the earth, each beautiful in their own extraordinary fluttering way, and each given a name that shared and honoured something of that beauty. Lilani hoped she would remember all the names she had heard. She squeezed her eyes shut and tried to see the words written in her mind's eye, seeing Mariposa and Farfalla and Papillon spread out in coloured letters as bright and beautiful as the butterflies themselves. She sat in the corner of the greenhouse with her eyes shut and imagined travelling to all the places these butterflies came from. And she imagined all the flowers that must be in the gardens of those countries. She saw herself in an English country garden just as she had seen in her brother's photographs, with endless pink roses pouring over little white fences and delicate blue lavender and yellow honeysuckle 
and purple wisteria draped around doorways. And before long, Elani was quite asleep, breathing slowly in and breathing slowly out a pile of leaves, the softest pillow beneath her head. She didn't notice that Calais came and scooped her carefully into his arms and held her close to him, carrying her back to the car and driving slowly home, taking the road that wound along the shoreline so the soft sound of waves easing themselves back and forth across the sand, would be sure to keep his little sister safely wrapped up in her dream. She turned and smiled as he carried her to bed, tucking her in beneath the blanket and wondering what it was she might have meant when she mumbled words in languages he had never heard and talked of soft leaves fluttering and summer birds. May your dreams come to you on the wings of the Pulelewa, he whispered softly into her ear, using the Hawaiian word for butterfly that he knew to mean blown on the air. And Leilani smiled, and snuggled a little further under her blankets and whispered back, Pulelehua, and sighed the deepest, happiest sigh Kalei had ever heard. He wished for a lifetime of Thursdays, of dancing in the car and cakes by the stream and butterflies balanced on the tips of noses and the soft, safe happiness that comes with the most wonderful days.